Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Data Modeling Fundamentals. It is the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Data Ed. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. To open the Q&A or the chat panels, you may find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and will likewise send a link of the recording to the session, as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is an internationally recognized data management thought leader. Many of you already known him, know him or have seen him at conferences worldwide. He has more than 30 years of experience and has received many awards for his outstanding contributions to the profession. He has written dozens of articles and 12 books. And Peter has experience with more than 500 data management practices in 20 countries and consistently named as a top data management expert. Some of the most important and largest organizations in the world have sought out his expertise. Peter has spent multi-year immersions with groups as diverse as the U.S. Department of Defense, Deutsche Bank, Nokia, Wells Fargo, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and Walmart. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. And welcome to you, Shannon. Thank you, as always, for a great introduction and getting us started here, as well as hosting all of these things. And uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, our topic today is data modeling fundamentals. And I'm going to use this icon in the upper right-hand corner to represent data models in general. It's not a good one, and don't let's get into the details of it, but just use it as an icon because lots of those icons together make up something larger called a data architecture. That is something that organizations are constantly attempting to get towards, but have a lot of trouble uh, making use of in a very productive way. And we're gonna start out actually by talking about Seth Meyers for a quick second here. So this is a, a quick setup here. Seth has of course nothing to do with this, but I love his show. And uh, he did this bit the other night and I thought it would be just really, relevant because you see outside of the people on this webinar not many people care about data so the setup with this is i like to pretend that i ran into seth myers and gave him my business card and he turned it into the joke that is this business cards really we're still doing this i hope your business is waste management because this is going right in the garbage <laughs> giving someone a business card in 2021 is basically steampunk great I'll give you a call when I need my cotton gin repaired. <laughs> Thanks for the business card. It's a great way to be sure I'll remember you in six months when I'm cleaning out my wallet. Dinner receipt, dinner receipt. All oh, right, this. Call me if you ever need data yes. And what are those? You'll have to call me to find out. The only thing business cards are good for is to put in that fishbowl at the diner to see if you can win a free Reuben. Hey, business cards, get bent, you burn. So aside from the fact that uh, the, the bit is about business cards, the subject of it being data solutions, and of course, nobody having any idea what they are, is really the message here. And uh, there's just so many opportunities to, to do this. And what we're going to do today is, is talk through a whole series of these, which are the data modeling fundamentals that I really come about observing this. So we'll talk in, in three parts generally what is data modeling good for then why model data and then how to use data models effectively then we'll get to the last part of this course which is the uh, q a and uh, look forward to uh, your questions and interaction as always let's jump in and, and talk a little bit more about this so first thing we're going to do is precisely define data and i'm going to do that by tossing out a not so random fact, although perhaps to you, the number 42 is a random number. And I'm gonna assign three different meanings to that number. The first one is the most popular, which is that it is the meaning of life, the universe and everything according to Douglas Adams's book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And in 40 years of doing this, I've never once failed to come into a room anywhere in the world and have at least one person who has read this book. And when I ask, what is the number 42? They say, life, the universe, and everything, the meaning of life, universe, and everything. So there's a random fact there. Here's another really important fact. It is uh, uh, Jackie Robinson, 42 uh, 
Jersey uh, on that for the, uh, the, the fabulous career that was. And 42 could be my age 21 years ago uh, if I were trying to determine what whether I was old enough to purchase alcoholic beverages in the Commonwealth of Virginia. So there are three random facts that are assigned to the number 42. And it is, as I said, just a random fact until you pair it with a specific meaning. That combination of fact and meaning is a datum. And I gave you three datums there. The collection of them all together are called data. Uh, it's very difficult to get into the plurals and the rest of it here. But we're not really interested in all data. We're interested in what data can be useful to us given that situation here. So uh, again, useful data, we can also then define the difference between data and information by saying what useful data has been requested. Uh, and as nature of those requests turns that data into information. That's an objective fact. It's a really wonderful way to do this. And it makes obvious the, the statement that you can have data without information, but you cannot have information without data. And then finally, to get to the last part, which is the way most three-part charts work, uh, is that everybody wants to use the words intelligence over years. We've used the words wisdom and knowledge also synonymously up here. But the, the differentiation, as you can see here, is what is their strategic use given that as a context here. So those are the three levels. Uh, data is a combination of a fact with a specific meaning. Information is when that data is requested. And uh, then after all the requested data uh, of the subset of that, this group that is strategically used, that's what becomes our intelligence around these concepts. And this is a very stable architecture. It's held up long time. Uh, these definitions have been around since at least 1983, uh, utilizing these. Let's see how this now detailed model that I've showed you here has to be implemented in systems and how it came about as the history of things. And that the, this is simply to say that us old people that are in this for a long time know that many of these systems started out as siloed applications. That meant the payroll data was connected to the payroll and the marketing data was connected to the marketing group and everything else. And you can see these piles of data still exist even in today's environment. Uh, sometimes there are some components that helped get us towards these things. And we'll talk about those in a little bit, but generally you still have a lot of these things. And when we try to connect them, of course, it becomes very difficult. Uh, I'm reminded of the, the uh, game of, uh, uh, so, uh, sorry, where you, you spin the, the dial and uh, sorry, twister and whoever doesn't fall down last wins, right? Well, not falling down is not a very high standard uh, on this. And this is a very complex environment for most organizations to maintain. So over time, we try to integrate these things into some piles and try to define some specific enterprise data so that we can pull all of these things together. And eventually, if we can re-architect the process and come up with a nice uh, spoken hub model for this, whether it's an ERP or around a, an ODS or whatever kinds of things, depending on your application. This is sort of the goal, but this is more the reality uh, that organizations are facing. And there's a, a number we can put on the upward theoretical complexity of this, which is uh, in this case, n times n minus one divided by two. Don't worry, that's the only equation we're gonna do today. Uh, but you can plug n in and n will come up with a number of worst case scenarios uh, should you have to literally connect everything to everything else, which is obviously the most expensive solution uh, in all of this. And just to give you a, an idea of a reality number on here, I was at uh, Royal Bank of Canada a number of years ago, actually decades ago, and uh, they had 200 major applications and told me I could use their numbers, which resulted for them in 5,400 batch interfaces that were connecting all of these systems together. So that was a, a fair amount of complexity of this. And let's just take a quick look and see what that looks like. So if I take N and add a zero to it, uh, 660 and 600, you can see the number increases rapidly. And uh, the number of connections only being 201 on this graph, but the number of uh, potential interconnections is 180,000 practically. And Royal Bank of Canada actually compares very favorably. I'm giving them a clapping hands, you know, at this situation uh, because they're well below the worst case scenario. Of course, what are we faced with in all of this is trying to have data go through as many hubs in one form or another as we can. That's a non-technical term. It's a logical term. It's a connection. It's a place where things are at. And each of these hubs must have an accurate 
up-to-date, correct data model to represent the data that's going through these hubs. You use these data models to capture and maintain formal system data requirements. They are usually in a physical nature. This is an organized purposeful structure regarded as a whole and consisting of interrelated dependent data elements. I'll show you some examples of this as we go. It represents the lowest level of decomposition that is available when we speak of systems. That is, systems are always talked about as people, process, hardware, software, and data. But of course, the data part is increasing at an increasing rate, and the other parts are not. Data models are, by necessity, the most stable system component over time, because you can see the role at the center of the hub means that they are going to have all kinds of pressure on them not to change because you, everything that goes through the hub then must change when the hub changes. The business hubs tend to incorporate useful organizational business rules in them, such as the answer to the question, can a project be owned by more than one department? Catch me offline for that uh, rest of that story on, on that particular one. But the, the bottom line, of course, is if it isn't correct at the data model representation, all other interpretations must therefore be suspect. So the goal, of course, for our organizations is to minimize the interconnections that we have here, get as few hubs as possible, explicitly balancing various points of risk. Uh, again, many organizations have gotten in trouble for having too few hubs. Uh, so the question is, where is the right balance between them? But again, regardless of how many you have, you have minimum data model at the heart of every single hub. It's the only reliable means of communicating the enormous amount of information that hubs are required to run organizations. Also, it is an objective use of standards within and across organizations, even perhaps extending to our business partners. It can always be inferred, even if the documentation has disappeared, it can be retrieved by doing what is called reverse engineering. Get this though, data modeling is not considered a necessary IT skill. Business and IT decision makers are generally not knowledgeable about these topics and business and IT are generally pointing their fingers at each other and saying, you're responsible for the data. And this confusion has reigned for decades, which meant an enormous amount of data debt has accumulated on this. Uh, today's IT environment is likely to look a little different. We're gonna have applications more and more in the cloud, which is uh, probably appropriate and, and should be uh, in there. Although if you're really fortunate, if I were in a room, I'd say raise your hands if you have multiple clouds, because that's always lots of fun. But we never really get rid of all the legacy stuff. And once again, even in this kind of an environment where there's no databases at all to anybody's knowledge, the data map across and between these software packages and in and out of the cloud is even more crucial to do this. This shared point of understanding where you're documenting and blueprinting a set of commonalities and interconnections that go back and forth between all of these things, making sure that we agree across humans between business and IT or business and the data people, uh, but also between humans and systems in general. So multiple goals of understanding on this. Let's take a, a deeper dive into it. data modeling then is the process of discovering, analyzing, and scoping data requirements. And once you have that first step done, then representing and communicating the data requirements in this precise form called a data model. We also use data modeling as a process to design data structures that support the specifications around this. The model, of course, is a representation of something that exists or a pattern for something that can be made. It can be one or more diagrams, standard symbols, org charts, blueprints. These are all models that we use in daily life. And a data model then is an analysis and design method that we use to define data requirements. We hope to develop not just the picture, but also the data dictionary definition with it as well, integrating the collection of specifications, pulling together standardized text so that it can be read across various disciplines, generations, et cetera, et cetera. And one of the more important reasons for having a data model is that this is one of the best ways to represent not just your data model, but also your business model, because data models represent stable shared data. That is, if you're going to share these things across business partners or within the organization, they are required and they make sure that you have these mutually agreed upon definitions becoming therefore standard 
uh, data candidates that the organization can decide whether to support and make standard across the organization or just within limited parts. Uh, data models are the skeleton of the business architecture. I've seen so many uh, organizations do this, and we'll, we'll look at another uh, later on where we can see how these things uh, all fall into play. If you're a gardener, you would say they form the bones of the garden, and uh, that would be a term that uh, most people would understand. The, the data portion of businesses have been and will continue to be the most stable part because of that dependency that I spoke about just a few minutes ago. But I've observed this over my 40 year career. One of the things I did early on in the late uh, early 1990s was create the US Department of Defense integrated process and data model for the entire department. Uh, literally 30 years later, this model is still in use in relatively unchanged forms. We did a good job with the model and it has been useful as a result of this. Uh, the models are also then a prerequisite to deploying as in you can't get money into your organization. You can't launch uh, without deploying these things. Many organizations are not able to understand this. They have an idea what their, their architecture, their data models look like, but they're not able to do as much with them as they potentially could and that represents opportunity costs that they're missing. Uh, that said, a data model is considered a basic part of any system documentation, but nevertheless, they are often missing in the process here. So let's talk about how it supports strategy. First of all, if you create a flexible as opposed to an inflexible data structure, and that means over time, as the business evolves, your data model may or may not need to change as often as the rest. So you can build flexibility in as a conscious design choice. You can result in cleaner, or less complex code that's accessing uh, all of these things. You can make sure that you can manage what you can measure. Uh, you can build in future capabilities, just like Tesla, unlock something new. Uh, again, particularly useful in a merger and acquisition component here. I've uh, seen this happen several times. Here's a, just an example. Uh, this particular organization had this data model, but you can see in the blue portion that I've highlighted down there below employee, uh, you had to be either a salesperson or a manager, which meant that when they went through one of their periodic uh, retrenchments and told managers to sell, there was no component, uh, no support for managers to sell because they had built it out of the system. A more flexible design would have had multiple designations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, around all of that. All right, so we've talked a bit about what is data modeling for. And again, I precisely define data. I so the, the data models represent places where the organization agrees to exchange data. And we need to simplify the number of point-to-point -point connectivities to the degree that makes sense from a risk and uh, effectiveness perspective. Because these focus points of agreement have a specific goal of making sure that everybody gets on the same page, sings off the same sheet of paper if we're making music. And that all of these concepts are not just useful in building new systems and talking about organizational strategy, but they're kind of necessary uh, around that, uh, particularly the physical implementation of the data components of whatever it is you're going to field. So let's uh, dive on a little bit further here and talk about why model data. And we'll look at it in the following way, looking at why model anything, we're gonna talk data requiring the most specific definitions. It is the lowest level of granularity that you have in systems, and it also needs to be perfect. That suboptimal data practices lead to an accumulation of data debt. Uh, data modeling, again, describes details that everybody has agreed must be perfect. So it's not just that you agree that they're there, you agree that they're also making the process perfect in there. Um, they have to look at data models as an iterative process from start to finish. And that's a little bit tougher uh, to think about because most people kind of get on, I want to get it done and uh, we'll, we'll get it fixed. But uh, again, that was it. And, and finally, data models are used modeling data to document the organization of the data in the organization. And so that's the direction that we're headed. So first of all, what is a model? 
Well, this is a wonderful picture that I'm building up here from uh, Ellen Gutson Diner, who showed it many, many years ago. And it just shows many things that a model can be used for. Uh, very, very useful set of concepts. This next piece, uh, if you're going to slow internet connection, I seem to be getting a pretty good one today. I'm going to go ahead and start the video. But if it's not coming across on your screen as well, you can click on that YouTube video and go see the same thing. Uh, I did not put the Stairway to Heaven music on this, but I figured since they had gone to the trouble of leaving it there, we'd, we'd let it go. Now, what you're observing, of course, is a, a, a model. Now, let's look at this and at the same time sort of pay attention to the bottom half of the screen, which is one day say, models can be used to represent expertise. They can store and formalize information. I could use this model that is showing in front of you to actually represent the timing of whatever it is I'm trying to do. It filters out extraneous detail. Do I need lots and lots of things? For example, if you watch the beginning of the clip, you can see that the individual who started this put his foot on the bar. Uh, that was certainly not part of the model, but it was probably not extraneous. Uh, this gives you the process of an essential set of information, allows you to easily understand complex behavior can you imagine if I was trying to describe to you what these uh, um, billiard balls were doing right at the moment? It allows you to predict system responses, challenges, et cetera, et cetera. It gives you the ability to communicate. Uh, whether you're a novice, whether you're a business person, whether you're human, streamlines the documentation, models and predicts the responses, gain information from the process of just interacting with the model. You evaluate various scenarios, you understand behaviors, you illustrate patterns and meta patterns. So what do I mean by meta patterns? Well, as you start to observe things from the world of looking at these patterns, uh, as these data models reveal themselves to you, you start to see these patterns occurring in other parts of the world and realize all of a sudden that a a randomly scheduling system for a dental office uh, bears a striking resemblance to uh, the, the queuing uh, structure that is required in order to get um, uh, enough cargo ships unlocked at this one particular port. Again, I made that up as an example, but those are the kind of meta patterns that you can get to. Okay, we've well, got the point here of this particular example. It's a wonderful way of describing this. I had one old friend write me on LinkedIn and said, I could just stare at that for hours, which, sorry, Margie, uh, but uh, uh, shout out to you. I'm glad you liked it. So let's keep on this. My modeling theme, why would you build a house without an architecture? The model, of course, is the sketch. Would you like an estimate? Yeah, yeah. It gives you an idea of how long it's going to take and what it's going to cost. If you hired people from all over the world, would you like them to speak a common language? Uh, you will see this at construction sites today where the communication through the blueprints is all that is required for different groups in order to work together. Um, would you like to verify what goes on the models can be reviewed before you build the thing uh if it was really good would you like to do it again yes absolutely would you make a change to it without understanding where were the various important components and again these models document this making life easier for everybody these data models of course exist whether you like them or not all systems have data models the question is whether your data model is understood and of course it cannot be understood if it is not documented and if it is not documented, it cannot be useful to you. So doing a poor job with data, unfortunately, leads us to, if we do this badly, we lock in imperfections generally for the life of the application. So you'll hear that's just the way it is as a common response to things that happen around that. Again, failure to, to um, do the proposed and existing ones uh, in here. The, the, it, restricts the opportunity that you can gain from long-term data because of bad design decisions, it can reduce the value of collections, decreasing the amount of data leverage in the organizations and truly accounting for between 20 and 40% of all IT budgets, migrating, converting, or improving data around. Bad data in general just costs everything to take longer, costs more, deliver less and present greater risk. Thank you to Tom Marco. And I mentioned data debt. Again, this is the idea that people haven't been doing this well, that the data models have caused data debt, that the time and effort it's going to take you to get back to zero is a very challenging piece. And getting back to zero just means you get to undo a bunch of existing stuff that night might or might not be in your existing skill set uh, of your organization. But then once you're at zero, you still are typically starting from scratch and this requires an annual proof of value. And now you get to give, become good at both of these things. Well, the nice thing is that data challenges are focused on some sort of 
exchange. I want this, you want that. Some sort of exchange is evolved. And that does give you a value component that you can incorporate into your prioritization on there. But there's very little guidance at optimizing the data management practices. We're mostly at the area of trying to convince people to get started with these things. The optimization part is a wonderful challenge and it can be done, but we haven't as much guidance in that area at this point. Very little guidance, however, at getting back to zero. Uh, and, and so again, just a challenging area that just like everything else slows progress, decreases quality and increases costs in a step-by-step -step unfortunate fashion. Now you may think, well, how, how bad could it be? Here is a query from a random customer. Uh, and again, nothing wrong with the query. It's a good query, but this particular organization had never heard of this particular, uh, excuse me, of the, the opportunity to do what's called query optimization, which is uh, finding out if there are things that are potentially repetitive. Was this put together perhaps sloppily in the first place? And the answer seems to be yes uh, in this case, because here is the uh, restored query that comes back on this. And while it didn't save but a, you know, a quarter of a second every time that it ran, it turned out that it ran a lot. And when you add these things up, they do become large. They do become countable. Most people use the phrase death by a thousand cuts, but the problem is nobody is dying on this case. So we call it unnecessary bleeding from lots of cuts. And until these cuts become more tangible where we can put some dollar signs on them and allow people to really understand what's going on there, they will not be able to relate to what it was what it is we are describing. I'll give you a, a very quick example here. This is from Forbes last year. Uh, in 2020, American Airlines market value was 6 billion and their AA program was valued at between 19 and 31 billion. Same thing for United, their market value was 9 billion. Their mileage plus component was valued at 22 billion. Both of the yellow and blue statements cannot be simultaneously true. Uh, it's just impossible. So we're gonna accumulate this much data debt is my uh, theory towards what's going on, why they can't unlock their own uh, value in there. This next little section here is gonna go into three sort of meta parts, again, sub pieces that we dive into. We're gonna look at the process of discovering, analyzing and scoping data requirements and figuring out what are the data things, what do they do and what, how do they interact? That's what we're trying to describe in the data model. Then we're gonna look at a quick section on representing the communicating, the, the precise form of it, the, the the critical aspects of it. Then we're going to talk about the differences between iterative and various modeling types in here. So let's go to this first piece just to see what happens here. Again, the idea is for organizational persons, places, or things, nouns, <clears throat> whose information needs to be created, read, updated, or archived. Uh, again, we call it a CRUD, C-R-U-D matrix. Um, Oh, and the attributes that go with it, those are our critical importance in here. So an organization might say, hey, here's a thing, and there's some description that we have here uh, in order to do this. If this case, we're assuming that sex to be assigned refers to male and uh, female things uh, that are supposed to say that all things may have a status. Um, things can be assigned to females. The characteristics may be unique. Uh, for example, an ID permits everything as distinct excuse me, identification of everything as distinct from all of the others. And description is likely to be unique for each thing because it's not uh, commonly shared across the thing types uh, in this case. Uh, what do we get into the next part of this? Well, looking at them precisely is, is really key. So what is an attribute? It's this characteristic of an instance in a collection of business things about which would create read and update information. For example, if I give you the attribute club ID. That tells us a little bit about it just for starters. Uh, for example, club needs to be identified separately from each other. Each club in theory would have its own unique ID. The pound sign there is a term that we use, a, a mark that we use to indicate a primary key in that. And that the club specific information is likely maintained because you're using a club ID as the source. That tells you that the rest of the information in that entity is likely to be about clubs uh, in there. And, and finally, then some concept exists above the club level. There's probably uh, organizations. If we've got clubs, they sum up to some level. There's probably more we can do. That's just from one attribute that we've looked at here. Um, attributes describe an entity. Again, here's a literal one, uh, not 
perhaps necessarily the best one, but uh, the attribute values are these characteristics of the interests of business things. So for club ID number one, uh, current promotion, whatever that happens to be is in there and it may have different information all onto this. Then once we've defined the attributes in each entity, we wanna relate each entity to each other. Again, poorly designed in this case, uh, I'm not gonna teach you how to do this well, I'm gonna give you the fundamentals uh, on this, uh, but, but doing it well is, is really uh, much, um, more straightforward than you'd think. So these are natural associations that are gonna occur between these entities, just saying that club, club member, and oh, I've got something over here on the bottom right called a cluster connector that is, seems to be some way of connecting these things. This is not a good way to design the data. And if people were using this system, they would likely be expressing frustration uh, about the entire process. So let's look at a, a family of variants for starters here real quick. We have uh, our, our good friend and colleague, Peter Chen, uh, and invented some notation, uh, our Charlie Bachman uh, had invented a style, uh, James Martin had invented a style, and, and Clive Finkelstein had invented a style. And uh, Peter actually is the last person standing at this point. Clive passed this last fall, unfortunately. But uh, he's, uh, he's the one that most people are picking. There's been lots of argument about these things and disagreement. It is not hard to learn one from the other. If you walk from one place to the other, it's like a different accent rather than a different language. But goodness sake, just pick one. And let's talk specifically about the variants. We can have exactly one. You can have one or many, you can have eventually one, which puts a little dimension of time in there, zero one, uh, excuse me, zero or many uh, on this, and finally, uh, eventually one or many. So these are possibilities that you can have in terms of the relationships that relate to each other. And, and again, here's just an example for the little icon that I used here. Uh, a bed is placed in one and only one room. On the other end, you say a room contains zero or more beds. A bed is occupied by zero or one patient, and a patient occupies at least one or more beds. Again, a couple flaws here. Um, how does a patient occupy more than one bed? Well, it turns out the answer is a time dimension, which is not not uh, categorized anywhere in this data model at this level of detail. Uh, what if the bed is moved? Uh, that becomes an interesting thing. And just out of curiosity, we'll ask the question, what is a room? So this is, first of all, a real good reason why every data model is incomplete unless you are accompanying it with a proper data dictionary that defines what is room as an entity and then what are the attributes of room that are made up in specifically uh, around the bed and patient. Again, everything in the data model. Here's another example uh, here, just fairly straightforward. Things can be related to each other. Each thing two must be accompanied by a thing one and each thing one must be accompanied by a thing two. That is a possibility. It's not a definite, but this is a specification here and they do occur. Uh, in here, so this is a valid specification uh, on this. Uh, bed is related to a room, that's nice and interesting, but we can be a little more precise about it. Um, bed is related, many beds are related to many rooms, that's a little bit more precise, and we can get even further uh, on this and say, many beds may be contained in each room, and each room may contain many beds uh, in this case. So we're looking at a subset of the overall process in a different form of the specifications, depending on exactly what goes on. And again, look at the nagging little question, what if beds can be moved uh, on here? So again, we're diving in a little bit. Let's go one step further. The process is iterative. And I've watched this occur over literally generations. So organizations become instantiated. They are integrated into data models. They're very interesting as components. These components authorize and articulate specific information system requirements. This is the way the process must work. If you're not involved, somebody else is doing it for you or somebody's making assumptions. But again, you cannot build a system without a data model in there. Question is, is anybody paying attention uh, in the process uh, of, of uh, understanding how this works out in the larger needs of the organization to exist as a program rather than as a project level. Of course, we need some feedback around this as well. Say, did we in fact satisfy the need that we were attempting uh, to? Uh, in this case, this is going to occur. Some data models change a couple of times over a decade. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's a very complex process because so many things depend on the data model. Hence, it is critical to get them correct in the first place. Uh, but again, these data models are developed in response to specific requirement. And when I say requirement, it is a process where you're trying to answer a specific question in there. So let's go to the last piece of this little mini section here. Again, what do we have in the way of modeling types, conceptual, logical, and physical? The 
It's our, a wonderful way of describing this. Conceptual is that everybody has a picture of any sort of concept of what, but no real concept of how. Logical eventually gets you into concept of how somewhat for getting you into the physical all the way. We'll repeat this process in a little bit. Uh, again, conceptual is sort of what, logical is very nice how, and physical is is uh, in order to do this. Uh, these are more precise definitions on the screen here in front of you, but the idea is depending on what type of question you're asking, you should adopt different modeling postures uh, because you're addressing different questions uh, around there. Uh, again, this process here is focused all on understanding data structures. And I've given you in yellow up there a yellow definition of uh, organizational information. Uh, again, very computer science-y, uh, but actually quite, quite useful here. We'll, we'll talk about it. But my, my bottom line is the fewer of these things that you have, the better off you are. And if you can create incentives to reuse these things rather than invent new ones, uh, it will simplify your life in the long run. So these data structures are the grammar, if you will, uh, that goes on. They constrain the data object, whether it is unique, whether it needs to be ordered in one form or another, whether it needs to be balanced, whether it needs to be uh, optimized in, in one form. Each of these are characteristics that one could describe here. And again, here's customer in a definite uh, in information engineering-ish uh, representation of what we were talking about on the previous screen. So as you can see, the components are details and they are organized into areas that give us this sense and, and reality of intricacy in order to do this, that the larger components are then organized into data models. And this gives us a sense of dependencies in there, because now you are starting to put things on and say this cannot exist, and whether these uh, uh, attribute values are mandatory or optional, et cetera, et cetera. Finally, we assemble these data models, as I mentioned before, into architectures. And architectures really get to purposefulness uh, in here. So in Data modeling terms, attributes are organized into ent uh, ent entities that are intricate uh, in nature in order to do this. And there's lots of examples that we can talk about uh, in here. These entities are organized into models. Again, uh, badly structured data constrains the ability of the organization to deliver lots and lots of examples around this as well. And finally, the models are organized into architectures that give us the largest component that we have in here. Uh, if you're seeing this for the first time, this is the DEMA International Body of Knowledge. As president of DEMA, I'd be remiss in saying how proud I am of the teams that have put this together again over generations uh, in order to do this. Data modeling, as you can see highlighted in yellow, is, is very clearly called out in this, which is the analysis of data systems, the design of data stores that are in there, the implementation of those, and there's additional data effort usually around uh, preparing or coordinating with integration around this. So we've talked a little bit more here about why modeling anything in the ideas. We've got to get down to a, a set that can be managed because we can't actually manipulate the reality of it, that hopefully now you have a good appreciation for why data requires precise agreements, that if you don't do this well, you have likely accumulated already data debt uh, that's in your organization, that your data modeling must represents agreements that have to be perfect uh, in that sense, that you're going to be looking at these things over and over again. And that's the best way to think about them being developed, which is why it's so important that they maintain as correct documentation. And, and finally, again, they are basic uh, system documentation. So if nothing else, you can go to any textbook, open it up and say, hey, here is the documentation on here. Okay, our last section here is how to use the data models effectively in this. And the first question is, people are going to ask when they walk into your organization, where are your data blueprints? Where are your data models? Where are the things that we need to have in order to correctly and carefully and precisely communicate this information back and forth? Uh, again, not everybody's going to ask for them. Some may be able to read them, some may not. They may have others that they can pass them to, but these are really very, very important collections of metadata that you must have in order to do this because everybody asks for the same thing. It's a universal language. For some reason, it's not universally created, uh, which is unfortunate. Uh, there are correct ways to organize the data. And the idea is we can determine that flexibility may be more important than adaptability 
or that retrievability is the more important. Uh, again, lots of different op, uh, optimizations can occur within there and the techniques allow us to include different components that are there. I'm just gonna go through them here real quickly. Uh, the idea is, first of all, as much as you can and any time that you can, remember and repeat, repeat the phrase, smart codes bad, dumb codes good. Let's all do it together, smart, codes bad, dumb codes good. So why is that the case? Well, my collection of uh, telephone numbers in Richmond, Virginia, uh, this uh, fall, November of 2021, lost its ability to dial within 804 area code. And why is that? Well, we simply ran out of numbers. We never thought we would create a situation where we would run out of the ability to signal long distance by putting a zero between two other numbers, and that would always signal, in that case, long distance. Again, smart codes bad, dumb codes good. All the telephone equipment in the United States had to be switched over uh, in order to do that. It was a complete hardware transformation, very much like the Y2K thing, not nearly on the same size since the Bell system absorbed it all, but it was still a problem. Another example, I had a dean who was a very nice gentleman, but we had these courses that were business computer courses on our university's list already. And he kept saying to us, I cannot add another course for you because you've used up all of your numbers. Again, that's a really bad way to talk about education that you can only have 10 courses because that's the scheme that you used. Or uh, a large organization that's involved in logistics it's got a, a number of very much like the Y2K problem. Again, they're going to have to expand their customer number from X number of digits to X number of plus digits uh, in order to do that. And they've already discovered that more than 100,000 systems in their existing environment are going to have to be changed. Well, that is an enormous amount of complexity in order to do this. So again, smart codes, bad, dumb codes, good. When you look at tables, you're going to be looking at the idea of generally relational kind of management. I've got one in the upper right hand corner there, but it would be a typical one that somebody might do unknowingly. Uh, again, if we understand the way in which database characteristics are expressed, we're less likely to introduce risk into the organization. So, for example, in this first example, the, the table just consists of song and an album. Uh, so I'm picking a really wonderful album that's come out recently uh, on this. And it's just got the song and the, the, the album that are on there. And you might say, well, doesn't the length count? And no, it's not used because the way iTunes, and I, I mentioned iTunes is going to be in there, but it's actually the app music now. They've switched recently, but I've persisted in calling it iTunes because I'm old and stuck in my ways. Uh, anyway, they don't use length. They use start time and stop time. And why? Well, it's more flexible and less risky than it would be to use the actual time in there because that time might require conversion where start and stop time at a constant pace will not require that particular area. So somebody might create this, again, I made note officially here, it's not iTunes anymore, it's called music uh, in here, but you can see there are the, the uh, uh, perhaps somebody unwittingly developing a database around this music app. So first question to ask is, could this be bad? And, and the answer is yes. So what information would be lost if I deleted record number one? It turns out if this is the only database in there at all, uh, I would have a, what's called a deletion anomaly. So if I deleted record number one out there, I would lose the fact that uh, purchaser number one had purchased Cool Walk Live uh, in there, but we would also lose the fact that Cool Walk Live costs 99 cents. And that second effect is undesirable and unintended. Uh, we've got insertion anomalies that are prone to badly designed data sets, data structures as well. If I'm trying to insert this number five record down there on the bottom and the, the faded uh, in there because it doesn't work. Uh, I'm trying to add that. This is a fact that I want to add this new song and this new song Cakewalk Live costs 1.29. Uh, that's the first fact. The problem is I'm trying to enter this without having a fact two, which is to say that I can't insert the full row until I know who the purchaser ID is. If I just put in purchaser number 99999, uh, that's going to cause bad results. And again, undesirable and unintended uh, in their update anomaly is going to be similarly problematic. If I want to change the price of this 
because I put it in there wrong the first time as 1.99, it should be 1.29 uh, in there. I have to go through and examine song and read through every instance of it. And I'll get that first one, uh, but I won't get the second one uh, down there because it's spelled differently. And that's a really bad way to make those kinds of changes. So the question is, how should it be done? Well, put the original up there in the right-hand corner and, and store as much as possible one fact per row. So the fact that's being stored here, row two, is a good example. Purchaser number two has, has purchased a song and the song has a specific value in that case. Let's move on and talk a little bit about uh, the idea that definitions are what people ask for all the time. So if you ask people, what is the definition uh, of your entity or your attribute, they'll give you the dictionary definition. We want to do more than that uh, with our data models. And the idea is to, instead of saying bed, something that you would sleep in, we want to actually get to the point where it becomes kind of useful for us here. So here's a, a purpose statement that describes why the organization should maintain information about this business concept. Uh, it talks about the sources, a partial list of the attributes that are associated with it. And we're looking right here at an association that says one bed room contains zero or many beds uh, that are in there. And that's where I'm pointing that particular piece to. So that's a, a way to describe it in there. Also in your models, in your data models, you should assign a status to each attribute, entity, and relationship. And all those statuses should be draft initially, because if you put them in as draft, it will give you the opportunity to go back and validate it. And somebody can say, you know, your data model is done, is it not? And you say, well, no, it's not done until I've changed the drafts into the validated pieces. Uh, uh, a way of giving yourself not just more time, but also a, a better approach on the process, because you're unlikely to be perfect on your first attempt uh, with all of this anyway. By the way, if you haven't noticed uh, on this as well, uh, we may have a, a bed transponder here, because, oops, I'm sorry. Oh, I, uh, Hang on too fast. There we go. I changed it. I wouldn't want to get off that slide just yet. Because the other part of this was to tell you the story, which is that this was a DOD piece that we were doing for the, um, uh, I believe it was DOD Health or, or Veterans Administration. I forget exactly which system this was uh, that we were working on. Uh, on, I literally have the data models in my attic because nobody else wanted them. Uh, silly, silly, silly stuff uh, around this. Uh, what we found out though was interestingly that the, the beds were going to be the way in which they were going to keep track of the patients. So they were gonna put a transponder on the beds and uh, the, the beds were going to have these transponders that were gonna tell us what room each bed was in. So the first question is, are we missing bed.transponder ID uh, as an attribute? Likely uh, that's gonna be the case. But second of all, we found out this probably idea was not gonna be a good one because uh, for example, we asked the question, what room is the hallway? And everybody, wow, oh, I hadn't thought about that. So can we incorporate the concept of near a room or just in a room, right? And again, that's GPS, uh, which will give you lots and lots of components around that, and whether that's technically feasible or not. Again, if it's not in the data model, it's not in the specifications. If it's not in the specifications, it's not in the system. If it's not in the system, people are generally going to be unhappy uh, for not having the functionality that they're looking forward to getting. This is picture of Fred Brooks. If you're not familiar with Fred Brooks, he's the mythical man month, uh, or the guy that said, you know, you can't just take uh, uh, one month apiece and, and create a baby by working in parallel. It doesn't work that way. Uh, lots and lots of uh, these around here. But the, the idea was that he also said the data representation is the essence of the programming. And if you show me your flow chart and conceal your tables, I'll be mystified. But if you show me your tables, I won't need your flow chart. It will be obvious. Uh, so the, the process is used to define, analyze, and understand these data requirements that gives some sense of the purpose of what's happening in here, that you have ideas of constraints that are going to be supported by or not supported by, depending on which information systems your data model is interacting. Is it internal or is it between uh, in order to do that? By the way, JSON is, is often considered to be a representation of a data model. Usually, uh, it agrees, agreed, gets that agreed upon data structure. It may or may not be considered a data model depending on what you're doing uh, in there. The idea is that if go in with a specific question on your data modeling, don't data model for data modeling sake, put at the top of your paper uh, you, that you're using or your model that you're using, the purpose of this model is to answer the following question. And there's gonna be a lot of specific variations that are gonna permit 
efficiencies around this. Let me just give you a couple of examples uh, really quickly. Here's a, a data model that describes clearly the difference, excuse me, the relationship between account, charge, bill, and subscriber. And more importantly, the model purpose statement says this model codifies the official vocabulary to be used when describing aspects of any of the following organizational concepts, subscriber, account, charge, and bill. Maybe very clear. This organization using data governance properly and data modeling as a tool has specified the controlled vocabulary to be used throughout the entire organization. I am not suggesting that this is a good idea for your organization, but it was a good idea for this organization in order to understand this. Uh, let's dive a little further into these data models. Here's an example second. Uh, again, describing here the use on the upper left-hand corner in the blue, and I'm just gonna call out number five here, which is a, one of many interpretations that are coming out of this, but there's nothing in the data model that prevents an automobile from being rented to multiple customers. There's no checkout service. There's no, the automobile is not available uh, or has a status in that set of concepts. Could that potentially be a conflict later on? It depends on your business model. Here's a number three example here. Two, two things on this one. Price notice is not part of catalog. Catalog is the table on the bottom row there. Again, just describing at the high level of the entity, which means that variable pricing is probably there in there, you know, something component wise, people are going to do different prices, get different prices. Uh, and the database can't tell what part of the order the invoice pertains to, because it doesn't have any section of it, it just gets an amount and paid, but it doesn't know uh, within there what the larger structure is necessarily uh, around that. Uh, one last one here, uh, again, a model for a hospital system. Uh, again, official vocabulary defined here and saying that this charge in this case, there must be a reason, a one-to-one -one, uh, net, excuse me, one-to-one -one correspondence between admission and discharge. And so in this case, it's kind of sad, but uh, discharge by death must be a disposition code. Uh, it was not something they wanted to have on their uh, uh, documentation, but it turned out to be uh, necessary and proper in order to do that. This next slide is very busy in the sense that I'm going to show you nine different modeling op options that you have in terms of data modeling across the space here. Um, do not try to memorize these, please. I just want to give you an overview. Remember, this is all taped, so you can come back and check it out later on. We start with where we start most of the time in the academic world of doing what's called forward engineering, building new systems. Remember, only 20% of our dollars are invested in building new systems uh, today, and 80% of our dollars are staying with existing systems. Here now are our three-part pieces that we did before, the what we need to do, the how we're going to do it in blue, and the implementation itself in the gray on the right-hand side. Again, being conceptual, a data model sitting at the middle there and an implementation as the other end of it here. We do 80% uh, of the time working on existing systems. We should get better at reverse engineering. We are getting better, but we should get better still because it is a necessary but uh, not widely understood skill. So our first data modeling is to recreate the initial data implementation. Our second is to recreate the original design. Our third is to recreate a data model of the original requirements. Turns out that data requirements are the most objective and most testable form of requirements, therefore the most manageable and the least subjective, uh, which makes them enticing to specify and be used as, as proper. Our fourth way is to reconstitute the data design by looking at the existing physical implementation to reconstitute the requirements by looking at the existing design. We'll then cross the line between new and existing, popping down here. If we're not going to do any changes to the requirements, we're going to redesign the existing data. If we are going to change the requirements, we need to come down that far left loop uh, in order to do that by redesigning the data uh, and then re-implementing on that. So there you have nine different ways, lots of metadata back and forth. Oh my goodness, how confusing. Let me take it a little bit more piece by piece. Uh, start out here on the forward engineering. Whoops, I'm sorry. I, again, once again, hit that too fast. There we go. Forward engineering is, is this process of going from what to how to the physical implementation. Again, we do that. This is the only thing that we teach young people, which is very problematic, I believe, from an education requirement since we spend 80% of our time working on existing systems. Uh, but that's a, a different argument that we have to have in here. So forward engineering is building new uh, around that. We're going to now go look at it reverse, uh, a little bit more detail again backwards. And there is a formal definition, a structured technique aimed at recovering rigorous knowledge of the existing system to leverage enhancement efforts. So we're going to go from the 
as built. And we may, depending on the situation, need to go back to the requirements. Many times you can simply stop at design in order to do that. So I'll stretch it out a little bit further in here, put in our line, dividing the new and existing again. And we pull to the left there if we're going to change our requirements. We first reverse engineer the existing system to understand its strengths and its weaknesses. Every system does something well and something poorly. We need to understand the difference between the two or we're not gonna be able to utilize this information uh, going further. Uh, then, of course, it's incumbent on us to use this information designing the new system. I've seen people reverse engineer and then not use their knowledge and go straight with something else. Uh, it just boggles the mind uh, in some cases. When you have this much information, now you pull it all together in here. So model evolution is kind of an interesting component in here too. Most of the time when people do data implementation, they do what's called forklifting. Uh, so it's not how to do it, but it's what is done. And they grab a copy of the data and they bring it into the new system in there and, and they map it in with a spreadsheet. And uh, again, first thing you need to do is get rid of that forklift as a concept in there and understand that, that this technology dependent component to go from A to B needs to go back through the design. Again, first reverse engineer the existing system to understand its strengths and weaknesses, particularly when you recognize that it's a data model that you're reverse engineering in here. And that data model is going to be the foundation of things going forward for perhaps decade and use this information to inform the design of the new system. So the way this is taught is typically we say you start out here with your uh, physical as is, then you go to your logical as is, then you go to your logical to be, and then you go to your physical to be. And that sounds very nice, but nobody understands why. And that, the reason that's insufficient is because you need to go backwards to pull this physical as is to the logical as, but at the logical as is, you start then incorporating different components of data in there. And this is where your logical model changes in conjunction with the business. You formulate your as is and go forward in order to do that. All of this modeling takes place within a system that looks kind of like this, which is to say you have your conceptual, logical, and physical, just what we've been talking about all along, and validated and invalidated. And every modeling change can be mapped to a transformation on this network. Each modeling cycle has its own specific articulated purpose. Key is to keep them focused on the data model purpose. The reason we're locked in this room is the way you want to say it. Uh, we're going to understand the relationship between soda and customer. We have to make sure that that is correct because we need to walk out the door with the data model of that relationship. We need to understand the difference in a different situation between our hospital beds. Uh, so again, when we walk out the door, we can talk about the top three characteristics required to manage hospital beds. That our mission is to, could our systems handle job sharing if we were going to implement it tomorrow in response to a court order, for example? Well, you know, here's our existing, and again, we're not exactly sure, but we're going to have to make sure that we uh, implement this very, very rapidly in order to do it. The, another key to this is don't tell people that you're data modeling. Just write some stuff down, arrange it a little bit, and then make some appropriate connections between your objects. Uh, it becomes fairly straightforward. Uh, again, you identify the entities from your notes. Uh, you identify a key for each entity. You draw a rough relationship between them, what themes to be connected uh, in there, identify the attributes, put the attributes on each specific entity that we have as, as we map them back and forth. Don't stop there though. Uh, again, that iterative process is important because with refinement, you will then discover new ways of organizing, new ways they should. Hopefully your model gets more stable over time. That's the important thing to watch for, not just the fact that it's done or not done in order to look at that. And you may discover that there are other associations that you need to have in order to bring it there. All right, so finishing up here, we've got, again, times and the type of modeling that you're going to be doing. You're gonna be collecting primarily at the early cycles of your modeling. And when you get to wrap up, you should be done with the collection and just being uh, analysis at that point in time. That you're gonna have some coordination requirements, you almost always do uh, in that process, but they should decline over time and that you should be able to do increasing amounts of target system analysis, which gives you the data model in the context in which it's actually doing the work. And that your cycling time changes from refinement, uh, excuse me, from validation to uh, refinement uh, in there, that you get to the point where you have time to go through and validate the entire 
model and look at it uh, as, as it's going on. There are lots of places that you can go to for data models. I call them metadata models. Again, here are four, four books up there. Example, one of the models you buy, uh, Len Silverstein's book, for example, bottom right-hand corner, and it comes with a CD-ROM. If you remember how to find and use those things anymore, you can put the CD-ROM in and then you can get the data model. It's fantastic. What an amazing thing. All right, so we're finishing up here. The goal, trying to get to shared understanding. The data exchange is automated and it's very highly dependent on successful architecture and engineering, and it's got to go fast, which means that data model has got to be perfect in there. Any imperfection stays with it the length of the system. The modeling characteristics evolve. The model is problem defining as well as a problem solving activity, and the use of modeling is more important than the specific method, that the models are living documents and that they need to be available in a searchable manner and that the utility is paramount, that you need to be able to add color and pictures on it if you need to in order to come up with all the bits and pieces uh, around all of that. Uh, again, quick note, pricing on sale for the books. And we've got some upcoming events. Hopefully see you next month for Data Stewards. Give you a minute to think of some things and we get to the point of questions. So uh, again, I made the finish. And there we go, yay. 101 slides, Shannon. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, Peter, thank you so much for this great webinar. As always, there's been lots of questions um, about the slides. So just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording along with anything else requested throughout the webinar. Now, diving in here, um, custom models require a lot of prep work. What um, do you, is there, what tools can you use to rapidly prep the data, which can easily be flipped in the data model? So I think the questioner is asking about you're acquiring a pile of data, but you don't have a model of it. And how do you get there? Uh, and that that is uh, sometimes a lot of prep work and sometimes it's very easy. Uh, you'll notice, for example, that many programs allow you to import a CSV file uh, onto the web services or, or something along those lines. So there's certain predefined things that you can, can get to work reasonably well. Um, Reverse engineering again becomes important when we're looking at this because the idea of, of saying there's a data set there, I don't know exactly what it means, but if I can reverse engineer it or uh, again, big data uh, components and it, it's no such thing as big data, so we'll call them big data technologies, but big data technologies can, can dive in and come up with these schema-less reads, uh, again, depending on what your shop has. Um, I, Many people, though, I, I've helped people read their Oracle catalogs uh, because sometimes they don't have any more definition than that. And the Oracle catalog is a wonderful metadata repository if you know how to read it correctly. I think that answers the question, Shannon. I'm not positive, though. So hopefully yeah, you know, they'll let us know. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we, we are a vendor neutral company. We try and stay vendor neutral. But, you know, what modeling tools um, are out there that are available for help? Uh, I, re I reached to my handy Irwin, right, is the, the one that I go after for, for most of the reverse engineering because I incorporated that early in there. Uh, that's great. There's probably others that you know, though, because I think you know the space better than I do. There's lots of tools, lots of really cool things. I think it depends just on what your needs are and what tools, what other products you have out there that you need to connect with and all that groovy stuff. Um, uh, you know, people often uh, interchangeably confuse between data model and database model. Could you shed some light on a clear cut between the two? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, Shannon, I had to smile too, because uh, you, you actually said something, you know, was fun with our little geekiness on here. So <laughs> we're great. All right, let me go back to uh, the slide here. And the questioner is asking the database model. Well, let's, let's do two different things. Um, so a database model is the actual model of the database and it has to exist on the right as built. If it is not built, it cannot be running. If it's not running, it's not built. So as built, virtually anything that is as built can be reverse engineered to some degree. We can pull that data back and understand what the, the data design of that as built model is. That can occur for a database and it can occur for a component of a data architecture or just for a software system without the database. They can also use data models. So the data models are irrespective of the physical implementation. Uh, the, the question then between logical and physical, okay, we'll call the middle column logical, the left column, the red column, the 
uh, uh, conceptual, logical in the middle again, and, and on the gray on the right-hand side, the physical. The physical would be how you implement it in database X uh, or database Y or whatever component that we're looking at or is implemented in cloud uh, offering X and Y uh, that are out there. Uh, the, the logical component then says, well, the cloud may implement it that way or the physical implementation may be this way. But in order to do what I'm trying to do to get to my most simple and my, my most effective design around that, that is the key. And that can only be uncovered, not by looking at the physical implementation, but as a logical, a technology independent representation. And that's our definition of the difference between physical should have a one-to-one -one physical component correspondence with the components that are out there in uh, uh, digital land uh, that are out there. And the, the, the logical would have uh, more of a conception, sorry, more of a correspondence to business concepts that we need to speak about in there. Yeah, great question though, thank you. I love it. So, um, oh, so I get this question a lot, Peter. So should a data model be the responsibility of business or IT? Yes, next question. <laughs> So you know, again, questions are asked like that all the time. And what I say is that IT would have a very difficult job doing it all by themselves. So the best answer is to have a cooperation that occurs between the business and the IT and the IT go and say, this is what we know and understand about your business. Uh, as, and by the way, that's very different than asking them, tell us about your business. Because while people are happy to tell about their business if they have time, if they don't have time, they don't want to tell you about their business. On the other hand, people are, are much more likely to, if you show them a design of some sort and say, this is how I understand your business right at the moment. Uh, am I correct or not? They, they're very happy to edit and tell you what's not right about that. And that's great uh, in order to go forward on that. So again, great question. Thank you. So, oh, my sorry, my my questions just moved on me. So, will the golden record definition be the input for our master data model um, logical entity relationship in master data solution? Well, it depends on on how you're going about it, but in general, that's the concept that you're looking for. So, uh, again, I. I I've read so many data strategies over the last year that say we're going to have our data input once and reused all the time. And those are wonderful aspirations, but making all your systems actually get to that point is a, a very difficult uh, component. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's it's the idea that in most of the, the, the context, when you're looking at how uh, all of these are organized, one has to understand that the formality of it is really the key. If we don't have it written down somewhere, you have people who are guessing. And the guessing is not the answer that leads to rapid success. Let's just say that. Sorry, Shannon, I might've got off track on that one. Did I get the question? I believe so, yeah. So uh, the golden record definition with the input of M master data model in master data solution. Yeah. yeah, so MDM, MDM is a strategy, not a technology. And so if you're working towards that strategy, that one of the components of the strategy is that you need to have golden records. And this will help to identify those golden records or can be a help at identifying golden records. I'll tell a funny little story on the way. Um, one of the things I was involved in was the DOD Y2K uh, component. I actually created a data model for how data flew through the business side of, of uh, the Defense Department. And got this knock on the door is like yeah hi we're, we're here from this you know place we can't talk about but uh, we understand you did this and I, yes i did and i said uh we'd like your copies and i said oh well, i'll be glad to make you a copy and they said no no we're taking your copies as well because it turned out the putting of all that stuff together was classified higher than my uh, uh top secret at the time or whatever it was that we uh, we had around that anyway long story short the the models are very important uh, in order to do that so key key to them So what is the expected structure of data architecture diagram, conceptual LDM, PDD, and data cataloging tool? It sounds like they're asking a specific question about a specific tool, but I think we can still get to some value there. So let me go to the um, logical physical uh, model slide here. There we go end of this section in the beginning of that so I've got this poor presentation uh, so in my head all right uh, and I didn't hit the right one there we go uh, 
All right. So uh, again, conceptual, logical, physical. And as I mentioned before, all of these should be linked by an integrated data dictionary, glossary, whatever it is that you're going to call it uh, in there, but that they're all using a common controlled vocabulary for the things that they have data models on. And, and that by itself is just as important as that first data model example that I showed you all that said this, in, this company says, this is the way we are going to do things, right? And they weren't that vociferous, but they were quite clear about it and they wanted to make sure everybody understood it because they realized that the lack of standard vocabulary all along had been the one of the major sources of that uh, bleeding unnecessary from too many cuts uh, stuff that we did a little while ago. Uh, anyway, I think I answered the question, Shannon. If not, somebody will clarify for sure. Indeed. So what's the difference between DCAM and DMBOK2 data management framework? much for, for this one. We'll have to do a whole uh, webinar on that one, Shannon. Uh, great question, but it's, it's just a very complex uh, uh, piece. So no, we're not going to get into that here. So what is the point of having enterprise data architecture, which is uh, unreadable? Shouldn't we be building data models based on critical data elements? Yes. Uh, again, one of your duties as a modeler is to determine what is an essential component of the model. The model should only show essential components. So if flavor isn't important to your model, then don't include flavor as an attribute. Uh, I'm not at all suggesting anything for or against flavor as an attribute, but that is that is what your, your role is, is to make those decisions uh, around that. And the idea of, of having those decisions uh, made by somebody who's not as familiar with them should be scary to organizations. So that they shouldn't be just saying, well, because this happens, right? The process happens whether you want it to or not. It must happen in order for these systems to be filled. Somebody is making a data model. It may be a good one. It may not be a good one. Uh, and I wouldn't want to leave something that's going to be around for as long as data models are to uh, chance uh, in any way, shape, or form. Sorry, I got on a high horse again, Shannon. Did I get the question in there? <laughs> You did indeed. Uh, and if the question has any ex extension to that, uh, definitely in and, I'll, and I'll get that asked. So um, how is data architecture different from data model? Um, how they both interact with each other? Yeah, so the idea is when you have a data model, that model is a part of your data architecture. And the architecture is comprised of the models that you have that make up your data architecture. Um, it's unfortunate that we don't have better definitions than that. Uh, I don't even have a good uh, representation of it in here, just this sort of multicolored blob, if you can see where my cursor is waving on the screen there. Um, that's just one of many data architectures that I have. But, but the question of readability is of course important. If however, the architecture is made up of model. And let's, let's, let's just for sake of argument here, for the sake of the questioner, pretend that our situation is such that we have orange, everything in orange on this chart uh, we have uh, as part of our data architecture. And uh, everything else is relatively unknown. And so the next step that we need to do is we need to go out and we said the green is the next area that we're going to attack. So we have the green pieces that are up here in order to, to pull all of this together. Uh, each of these can be components to the system. Each of these are data models. And we may only have at the end of the cycle, the green and the, the orange parts, but those still should be readable because they're built of data models uh, so that all the green and all the orange is now accessible to it. And we have less of the overall organization that we need to have in order to look at it. And as you're prioritizing projects, as they're coming across desks, you can say, look, if I do this one, I'll get this piece of the puzzle and I'll answer that and I'll save some business uh, on it, people don't realize that these insidious little data problems are not represented to people as data problems, right? Nobody's jumping up and down going, this is a data problem. Instead, what they're doing is they're, they're saying, oh, well, it's just Salesforce that sucks. And again, I'm not picking on Salesforce, but if you, as most organizations seem to today, implement Salesforce, stick the data in and then decide that maybe you should have cleaned the data before you put it into Salesforce and then turned it on, you're not gonna clean it in place users can't distinguish between Salesforce sucks, 
and the data that's in Salesforce sucks. So they just say Salesforce sucks and they try to cleanse that data in place. Uh, let's, let's put some things in place. Let's understand the Salesforce data model. It offers some wonderful opportunities to cleanse the data on the way in so that we don't end up with it stuck like that. And then if that happens to be the, the red part of the data model over here, the red part of the data architecture, that becomes another piece of your architecture that you know more about. Uh, so what I'm seeing is most organizations know some pieces of their data architecture and their part of their job is to figure out which are the important pieces that they need to know and which are the pieces that they can leave unknown, at least for the moment, uh, in order to do this. Because let's be frank, most organizations are operating without good knowledge of their data architecture. That's just simply in terms of the numbers that are out there. So very true. So which data quality dimension is mostly affected by a poor data model? That's a really insightful question. So there are two types of data quality problems. The first one is the what we call um, uh, um, operational data quality. It's the idea that you've got the wrong field or the wrong value or something's not right. Or uh, for example, if you pull my credit report, which is sort of weird, uh, you'll find that I own a office building in Texas. Uh, I don't own an office building in Texas and everybody who works with me knows that's not the case, but nevertheless, we joke about it every time because we can't seem to get it off my credit record. Uh, I don't owe any money on it, but I just happen to own it, which is kind of cool. Uh, obviously data quality here. Those errors are where most people's understanding of data quality stops. And they can occur through, of course, the architecture, the model, the representation, and the value of the data item as well. So it's a relatively close universe. But the other part of this, this may be what the questioner is getting at, is what we call structural data errors. And those structural components are very difficult. It means something along the lines of, and I actually, actually show you one because I put one into the uh, uh, presentation here. So let's get to it. Gee, Shannon, if I had plotted that, planted that question, I couldn't have done a better job on that. All right, so here we go. We're looking at club and club member, right? And, and you can imagine that the club would probably like to know who the members are. And uh, the members would probably like to know which club they're a uh, part of. Uh, seems like, you know, just sort of basic questions that we'd want to ask. I couldn't figure out, this was an example I was pulling from somewhere else, how you would get from club to club member. So I put in this thing called a cluster and uh, you can add whatever words that you like there, but it's got uh, two primary keys for the two other entities that could be used to cross match them. That's a really bad data structure. And that if, if the software was served that way, if Salesforce worked that way, it does not, but if Salesforce worked that way, you would have all kinds of things where people would be going, Oh yeah, that's right. And then there's Salesforce's well-known problem having to do with connecting clubs and club members uh, through a very difficult type of join in the process. Again, great question. I really, that's a badly designed data models are going to leave those kinds of errors in your systems and like a, a P under the blanket, uh, you know, or whatever uh, fairy tale uh, that you want to think about or uh, anything, but it's an irritant, it's going to last, and the data being the most important part of it is going to uh, stay there, so it's going to persist uh, in that format. So it's worth the extra time and effort to make sure that it's done. I, by the way, request that data models be provided as software that we're doing business with as well, uh, because I would like to know how the cloud component is implemented or how the software as a service component is implemented and whether it's going to complement or whether it's going to conflict with my existing process architecture as I have it. Again, high horse hand, Shannon, but that was a really good question. I do like it when you get on your soapboxes. It's good. <laughs> so Peter, with reverse engineering, you rarely have the descriptions of columns and tables in the database. So going back to the analysis phase is only partial. So how do you fill in the blanks or should you? Uh, as much as you can. In fact, that's how I cut my teeth. Now, my component of that was a really interesting one. And I'll go ahead and tell the story, Shannon, even though you heard a little bit of it last week on your interview series. Uh, but it's such a, a, an interesting piece. So let me, uh... yes, you get a partial set of information when you're doing reverse engineering. And uh, my first job at the Defense Department, I had the title US DOD Reverse Engineering Program Manager. 
And my job was very simple. There were 37 systems that existed in the Department of Defense at the time, and we needed exactly one, which meant there were going to be either 36 or 37 losers, depending on what Peter decided to do. Uh, one of the things that I was very fortunate to do was we invented the technique of data reverse engineering as a solution to that problem. Uh, and then I was ordered to write the book on it. So there's a, another whole story on the side. But I did about... Um, about $50 million worth of reverse engineering activities, both in preparation for Y2K and in the process of going from 37 systems down to one system uh, that, that won that particular uh, title uh, on that, that was the DOD winner. And the idea was we had to get all of that data around and together. And we had exactly the questions that the uh, questioner asked. Some of the systems were old, some of them had documentation, some of them did not have documentation. And so we inferred what we could. Uh, we tried to get a hold of people. We were able to call some people out of retirement, uh, believe it or not, and, and get information from them. We put together a series of hypotheses and said it's either wah, wah or wah. And then we'd ask subject matter experts and they'd go, oh, well, definitely not these two, so it must be the other one, uh, you know, things like that. There are ways of obtaining more information from the factual information that you have. Uh, it's not a trivial process, but it is a, a very much like a puzzle-solving process. So again, obviously took me back to some fun days that I had. I, I lit up over that whole process because uh, those were some interesting times that we had to learn uh, about all that. And there still are challenges around. Uh, if anything, my task was simple because I had a mainframe. Right. Whereas everybody else out there has got thousands and thousands of, of distributed processes and I haven't had any experience in that area. So uh, we'll let the youngsters uh, figure this stuff out. Anyway, great question. Thank you for it. So how much future, quote unquote, future proofing is suggested? For example, abstract party can be individual or org catering to international business currency codes through business is is uh, domestic today, the style modeling could be future proof, but a pain to model and generally business not happy at management response to too much future proofing. Let's work based on what you have today. Very insightful question. It is always going to be a trade-off. It's going to be worth some things and not worth others. Let me give you a tangible example that I can talk about uh, that was uh, uh, quite easy to determine the value proposition. Uh, I worked for a number of years for Deutsche Bank and their back office trading system is called DB Trader. Deutsche Bank trader. And it was the best on Wall Street at the time because it possessed three specific advantages. First, it was a real-time system. They didn't have to start and stop it. Two, it was multi-currency, so they didn't have to do currency conversion. They could see instantly what their various positions were at any point in time on the day. Three, the architecture of this system was table-driven. That decision meant that they could build new products without recompiling the system by simply making entries in a configurable series of tables. And the folks that they had there were geniuses at it. It was a wonderful system and it was specifically architected for that specific purpose. That's the good news. The bad news was that all that wonderful intelligence and business and data models were all encapsulated on something called a Wang computer. And Wang computers had been obsolete for almost 10 years at this point, and they were slowly going away. So we had a limited amount of time to make the changes and, and going across and encountered exactly the situations that everybody's raised here. And truly, I, I'll say this as well, because I think it was insightful. Um, the CIO at the time uh, was very, very wonderful individual who never quite got what it was we were doing. You know, I was the data modeler, so you sort of expected me to be data modeling, you know, uh, whatever that was. But he, he did say that when I look at my uh, shops around the world, and I go to Singapore, and I go to uh, Bangkok, and I go to Tokyo, and, and I see the data models on the wall, I recognize them, and I recognize the people who are using them. So I know you're making valuable products that my, my team needs in order to support this implementation. Uh, you know, I wish I understood it better, but at least I understand that it's important. And gosh, if I never got any other message through to him, that was definitely the message that I wanted to have uh, taken across to him. So he understood the data models and their utility. He didn't understand the data models uh, as far as that goes. Thank you for again, letting me pontificate for a minute on it. 
Indeed, and I think we have time for a few more questions here. So how much does data warehouse modelers have uh, flexibility to redesign or future proof in a better way in their own playground, for example, example uh, dimensional models or data warehouse modelers are um, the unfortunate group stuck to consuming poorly designed source as is with risks? If you have the opportunity to develop from scratch, there is actually a well um, established pattern, I think. Now, I have not read Bill Inman's latest uh, book, um, but I'm very familiar with where he was up to this uh, most recent development. And that is the idea that we now understand a different architectural construct in the data warehousing space called um, uh, Data Vault. And that gives the opportunity to encapsulate business rule specific data in a way that is combinable with other data if you have uh, the meta knowledge around it. Now, again, I'm getting a little bit esoteric here, but it is now recommended best practice that you start out to design a data vault. And then if you need to, you can easily divulge off into a dimensional or a relational or both uh, type of, of activity at that point. But the guidance at this point is very much to start with a data vault first and then go forward. If you're unfamiliar with it, Google Dan Lindstadt and data vault, and he's got a wonderful website that can get you started uh, in that area. Great question. And uh, all of, of course, those components that you described require modeling. And unfortunately, there are a rather large number of poor um, quality known commercial products. <coughs> Don't mention any specific names uh, around them that uh, have three letters and other things like that. But uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of discontent over that. And perhaps the thing that you could do is take solace in understanding the existing data model that's there and being able to look at the advantages and disadvantages that it has and maybe being able to design those into downstream products that can perhaps compensate for the bad original design. I've seen several caching schemes uh, overcome some of the ERP components uh, that are, are problematic around that. Um, but again, it's a fairly abstract problem, but uh, clearly bad data model, we're not gonna have much luck with it. And you can hear the, the disgruntlement in the questioner. Indeed. So um, can you explain the differences um, that we need to consider while modeling for a relational database versus cloud databases, BigQuery, Hive, AWS? The real key that everybody forgets is that the logical data models are going to be the same in all circumstances because logical only expresses the business requirements. So your conceptual and logical layers, if you're going that pathway, uh, should not be dependent. In fact, it is against the rules to use the word database during any of those first activities, the requirements activities, the things that are on the left-hand side of your screen. When you looked at them, the things that are the what we're trying to do. Uh, how then is a design decision, and that's when you are allowed to pick a database or uh, again, cloud technology or whatever, but all of them should have some components of data models with the exception of course of the lakes where they index everything. And uh, those are appropriate for certain circumstances as well, depending on what it is that you're trying to do. But in terms of modeling, absolutely. You're modeling the business requirements at the logical level that should not change. And if those requirements are not well specified in a model at that point, I would hesitate to imagine how anybody would develop a solution that was a response to those requirements since they hadn't been developed in the first place. I love it. And I think we've got one more question and just enough time for that question. Um, could you put up the slide that has the pricing on it? It was the next to last slide. The pricing on it. That's the next Wait. to last slide. I mean, the books? Event pricing. Oh, thank you. Where's that? Is that pricing on that? Is yeah, that pricing the, on it? It's on the title. Go back. If you go back to. I'm a dummy. Oh, event pricing. Okay, there you go. Uh, oh, it's event <laughs> pricing because that way you can get the coupon off while you're. I'm sorry, Shannon. Didn't mean to get this. <laughs> Great. It's good. I love it. Um, uh, yeah, and we will. Um, and of course, just a reminder. I will get the. Um, 
send an email up to everyone by end of day Thursday with links to the slides and links to the recording so you can have those as well and all that information on how to get Peter's books and more information from him. Uh, I love it. Peter, thank you so much as always. It's been a fantastic presentation to all of our attendees. Thank you so much as uh, for the great engagements and great questions coming in. Um, and again, just a reminder also get that follow-up email by, out by end of day Thursday. Everyone, thank you so much. I hope you all have a great and fabulous day. Cheers, everybody. Thanks, Shannon.